Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk about topic modeling. So what is topic modeling? Essentially, it's a way or a suite of techniques to identify latent themes in a corpus. A corpus being a group of documents, and documents could be anything from, say, newspaper articles to tweets to really any kind of text you want to study. So we might use topic modeling for a lot of different reasons, but the people who developed topic modeling like to think of it as kind of amplified reading. So the idea here is that it's a technique for seeing large themes in giant groups of texts that you could never possibly read yourself. Now, despite the intentions of the, the original kind of developers of topic models, topic models have come to be used for identifying variables or features in social science models as well. But let's start at the beginning. Let's go back to one of the first big papers about topic modeling. And that was a paper on so-called latent Dirichlet allocation. So LDA, as it's known, um, was first applied by uh, David Blay, a computer scientist now at Columbia, um, who was interested to see whether a computer could be trained um, using a variety of kind of Bayesian learning uh, to detect themes in scientific abstracts from the journal Science. So basically they read in, he and his team read in 100 uh, years of abstracts from Science, and they were trying to see if um, they could build an algorithm that could say, sort biology from chemistry and chemistry from neuroscience and so on and so forth. So this figure is kind of a schematic to give you some general intuition about how a topic model works. Now, the first thing that's a little dis disappointing to a lot of people is that the topic model doesn't tell you how many topics there might be in your corpus. Instead, you have to tell the topic model that. So in this hypothetical case, um, suppose there's four topics. Suppose we were looking for four topics. Probably there's many, many more in 100 years of the journal science, but just for the sake of argument, let's say there's four topics. Well, in this schematic, the four um, topics are pictured in yellow, pink, green, and blue. And what you see in those kind of panels on the left of this slide is the top words associated with each of those topics. So just like topic modeling doesn't tell you how many topics there's gonna be, it also doesn't name them for you. It would be great if it told you, this is the chemistry topic and this is the biology topic. Instead, the output of a topic model is two things. First, it's a list of words associated with each topic with high probability. And then it's an assignment of each document to topics. Now, something that's a little interesting and unusual about topic modeling compared to the, the techniques that came before it is it's a mixed membership model. So if you're familiar with cluster analysis, um, you'll know that there's something called hard clustering, which means an algorithm such as the k-means algorithm, which will sort a matrix into hard clusters. So each observation can belong to one and only one cluster. Um, so, you know, say we were trying to, uh, say we created our document term matrix, which we learned about in the basic text analysis class. We'll look at one of those in just a minute, but that's the matrix representation of a corpus. And then we just applied a cluster analysis to it like k-means. Um, we would have uh, each document, in this case, each scientific abstract have to belong to one unique cluster. Now what Blay and his colleagues realized, which is kind of clever, was that you know, there's a lot of in-betweenness. And actually when we force things into a single category, we lose a lot of that um, information. Now they certainly weren't the first people to develop mixed membership models, but they were among the for first to think about it in the realm of text analysis and natural language processing. So what does that mean, a mixed membership model? It means that every document has a little bit of resemblance to every uh, topic. So it may be the case that a topic is very likely to be associated with, say, a chemistry topic and only barely associated with a genetics topic. Um, but we can think of each document in this way as a mixture of different topics. And so that's what's going on in the kind of arrows on the right of this diagram and the histogram that's showing you the distribution of probabilities associated with each topic being present in the text, but you're also seeing how the topic model is learning the assignment of documents to topics, 
and words to topics in an iterative Bayesian process. Now, typically we use uh, an LDA, something like a naive Bayes classifier or a Gibbs sampler. Um, and basically we begin by randomly assigning every document some degree of membership into each of the uh, K topics that we uh, feed the algorithm. K always refers to the number of topics in topic modeling. And so then across each turn, um, we, we, in our kind of bag of words, where we're simply, you have this matrix that counts the presences and absences of different words, and we increasingly uh, create a better fit with that model. And then once we reach a point where our model is converged or we're satisfied that it's not gonna get much better, we stop and we take a look at the results. So here are some examples of the, what the results might look like. A list of top words associated with each topic. The same word, by the way, may appear in multiple topics because it's a mixed membership model. And then a group of documents and their assignments to the topics. So let's try it out. Um, we're gonna use um, the topic models package in R um, as well as the text mining package. And we're gonna use some data that comes with the topic models package. It's called the associated press data set. The AP, as it's known, is a large media organization in the United States, and it generously donated a bunch of its news articles to people doing natural language processing some years ago. And it's become kind of a popular data set for running topic models and all sorts of other kind of natural language processing analyses. So the first thing I want you to see is what the data looks like. What we have in this package is not actually the full text of the documents themselves. Instead, we have what I described earlier, the document term matrix. And again, if you don't know what that means yet, go back and rewatch the basic text analysis video where I introduced that in detail. But just briefly, a document term matrix is a representation of a corpus in matrix format. The rows are the documents and the columns are any word that appears in the entire corpus. Next, the cells of the matrix count the number of times each word appears in each document. And this is the typical data structure we use for topic modeling. So um, remember that it takes quite a bit of work to get to a document term matrix. You have to take a lot of text pre-processing steps. You may be dealing with character encoding issues. If none of those terms make sense to you, again, go back and check out the basic text analysis video. Here's how you run your first topic model. Um, we're gonna use a function called LDA. We pass the document term matrix called associated press to it. And then the second argument is very important, k equals 10. That's just a random guess of how many topics we might find in this corpus of news articles. It's probably wrong. Usually the first run of a topic model is very wrong and we have to split, either explore a range of different um, values of k or use some goodness of fit measures we'll learn about in a few minutes um, to help us kind of make a better choice. But above all, you should always use human intuition and human validation of the codes rather than allowing the computer to do it for you um, because we're simply not at the point where human classification has been surpassed by unsupervised algorithms, at least in my view. Finally, in this function, you'll see a control parameter. This is important if you want the results of your topic model to be reproducible. If you wanna be able to send them to your friends and they get the same uh, results too. Wow, you have lame friends if you're all doing topic modeling, right? Anyways, um, these are what this is what my friends do, I guess. Okay, so never mind that. Um, you want to set a seed. You want to set a random number so that the results are reproduced the same time each way. And that's the last thing going on in this function here. So now we can use the tidy text package to kind of clean up some of the results and some dplyr. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're pulling out the betas. Those are the probabilities of each word being associated with each topic, and we are grouping them. Um, we're counting the top 10 by topic, and we're creating a new data set that has each topic and the top 10 words associated with that topic in terms of their probability of being associated with that topic. With a ton of ggplot, a lot of aesthetics, um, renaming some stuff, flipping the coordinates, labeling some stuff, we come up with this graph. And what this graph shows you is the top 10 words associated with each of our 10 topics, um, and they're each colored differently. So if you kind of check these out closely, you'll see there's one that's kind of about the economy and another that's kind of about the Soviet Union, but then there's another one that just 
literally seems like random words, right? And that's not uncommon in a first run through a topic model. Typically, we've either um, underestimated the number of topics or overestimated the number of topics. And so again, we'd have to rerun them. So in this case, we would probably want to try a larger number to try to tease out whether there are actually, in fact, multiple topics hidden within that single strange topic that seems to just combine a lot of really random words. The real challenge with any kind of unsupervised text analysis, any type of cluster analysis, really more broadly speaking, is that we're often reading tea leaves. This is not my phrase, this is the phrase of Jonathan Chang, a data scientist at Facebook, who has a nice paper on validating topic models. And he compares it to the Japanese ceremony of reading tea leaves. So if you don't know about this, essentially, um, during a tea ceremony, once the tea is finished, the leaves of the tea arrange themselves on the bottom of the glass, and one then looks into it in order to see some type of pattern or um, some type of, um, you know, something that might happen in the future, right? And so obviously the way the teas fall is somewhat arbitrary, and then we as humans attach meaning to it. We're really good at that, right? Too good at that sometimes. And so this is the real danger with topic modeling. We may drop a certain value of K into the model, see something we like, drop a different model in, see something we don't like, and we don't really have a good solid process for figuring out exactly what our process should be. Um, there's some interesting work by Laura Nelson, um, an assistant professor at Northeastern, who's done a little bit of work on um, combining qualitative and quantitative methods. I've also written a little bit about this, um, but the short version of the story is nothing will replace high quality human validation and some combination of a kind of systematic approach where you at least try a range of different values and inspect them carefully, both by looking at the distribution of the top words, but also by reading the documents themselves and really trying to see if the topics that the model is showing you exist actually cohere into something that is meaningful. Another tricky thing is kind of what is a topic? So it was pretty straightforward when we were talking about scientific abstracts, right? We, we all know what chemistry is, we all know what genetics is, but can a topic model kind of find things like texts about democracy or texts about feminism? The answer is kind of, it depends on how you would define those things. If we can be reasonably assured that the co-occurrence of words is reliably associated with a term like democracy, uh, then maybe it could. Um, on the other hand, if there's something very nuanced about the style of language, um, something about the taken for grantedness of the text or some obscure references to democratic theorists um, that aren't reliably alongside words like, say, parliament, um, we may really struggle um, to, to measure things like that. So really, topics are kind of in the eye of the beholder, and that's another reason why it's challenging to use them and fit them into models and convince other social scientists that they measure something that's real in the world. So just as you're getting into it, resist the temptation to just let the, the algorithm do all the work for you. You still need to tell the rest of us what your model means. A really useful tool for doing that and improving upon some of the kind of core weaknesses of topic modeling is a wonderful technique called structural topic modeling. This is a package developed by uh, Molly Roberts, Brandon Stewart, and Dustin Tingley, three political scientists, and they have just a great R package. It combines a lot of the steps we've already learned in our basic text analysis class, like text preprocessing, and it also runs a structural topic model. A structural topic model is very similar to an LDA model, except that it exploits metadata about a document in order to improve the classification of topics within a corpus. Let me give you an example. Um, if we have, say, 100 years of newspaper data, and we have some articles about the war on drugs, which happened in the 1980s in the United States, and we have other articles about World War II, right? The term war is being used in both contexts, but obviously the term war in 1950 meant something very different shortly after the world, Second World War than it did um, in the 1980s. And so what this means is that something as simple as time could really condition the way that words should be grouped with each other. And so basically the structural topic modeling allows you to include those, those covariates as predictors of the probabilities in the assignment of documents to uh, topics. 
So um, the actual modeling is really nice. We get a little more specificity there, but then there, where the model really excels in my view is that it really helps the reader of the topic model kind of uh, interpret it, both by finding exemplary quotes, visualizing, and there's some great user kind of add-on visualizations we're gonna talk about in just a minute as well. And then also just generally browsing the data in a really deep way. And then also has some great functions for using goodness of fit measures to help you determine the value of K. So let's take a look at the package in a little more detail. I'm gonna draw heavily on the vignette by the authors of the package themselves. So here we're reading in a data set of political blogs from 2008. I put it on a Google Drive and we're simply reading it in with read CSV here. So if you browse the document, you'll see that each, uh, row, each uh, row is a different document or blog post. And there's a little bit of information on the date in which the blog, was, uh, was, blog post was produced, uh, the name of the blog, and then whether or not the blog is liberal or conservative. That variable in this data set is called rating. And so basically, um, what we did in a previous uh, video on basic text analysis, when we did things like stemming and uh, removing numbers and punctuation, we can do all of that in one nifty step with STM using the text processor function like we are here. We have to specify where the metadata are if they're not in the same um, data set as the documents. For us here, they are. We have a single data set that includes both the documents and the metadata, so we can just specify it as follows. Next, we have to create a few different objects which the package is gonna to use to help us browse the data later. Um, specifically, we're creating um, something we're gonna run the models on, a vocabulary of all the different words that appear, and the metadata itself, and the full text of the documents. Here's how we run our first structural topic model. So the core function in the package is STM. Um, we specify where the full text of the documents are, we specify the vocabulary, that's the unique words that ever appear. We give it a value of K again, that's the number of topics. And then in the next argument, um, we do something really important, which is we specify whether or how metadata should be used to predict topic uh, assignment, which is called prevalence here. So here, we're using some kind of regression style notation to suggest that we want to use both a smoothed value of the day variable to kind of account for shifts over time, and then also the rating variable, which again is going to say whether the blog is either liberal or conservative. Then we once again are kind of setting some uh, parameters to control how rapidly the um, model will proceed. And when you run this, you'll begin to see the iterations. And for each iteration, you'll see a list of topics and top words, which is kind of nice because you can get a sense of how rapidly the um, model is working if you set verbose equals true. Here we've shut it off just to save some space in our R console. Really nice, simple function is this plot function in STM. Here we're plotting the results of this model with 10 topics. And here you can see the first topic's not very impressive, you know, like one think, who knows what that is. But at the same time, there's clearly topics about the Obama campaign, about the McCain campaign, about taxes, about education, about the Iraq war. And so we can see at the beginning, it's, it's doing pretty well. Um, but likely we need far more than 10 topics, just like we needed more than 10 topics in our associated press example. So let's figure out how we do that. Well, the first thing we might wanna do is just kind of inspect a few of the topics. This find thoughts function is really handy for doing that. This allows you to pass the output of the topic model the full text, and then look for, in this case, two examples of topic number three. And it will, it will pull up passages of those documents that load really high to help you try to figure out what that topic actually is. Another really handy function is the search K function. Here, we run a, a structural topic model again, just like we did before, but instead of specifying a single value of K, we can specify a range. So here we've specified a range of, uh, sorry, this should say 10 colon 30, which would be every value between 10 and 30. And so once this runs, and this will take a while to run because depending on the size of your corpus, you know, a topic model could take anywhere from a few minutes to 30 minutes to run, depending on the speed of your computer as well. But then once we plot the output of search K, 
we see various goodness of fit measures that further help us try to interpret the output. Now, knowing the authors of some of these goodness of fit measures, I can tell you that they will tell you that these goodness of fit measures are no substitute for human validation of the model. But one, one way that I found them very useful to work with is to specify a likely range of where the best fit for the topic model exists. You know, maybe it's between 25 and 30 in this model. So the other nice thing about the STM package is you can work with metadata. So once you've used the metadata predict to, to predict the topics, you can also then study how the topics are associated with the metadata, which is often what we want to do in the first place with topic modeling. Very often we just want to answer descriptive questions. What were people talking about in 2008? Were liberals talking about different things than conservatives? When did each side start talking about different things? These are the types of things that we can answer really nicely with the STM package. So here, we're going to just plot the effects by a covariate, and we're going to plot them specifically by the liberal conservative rating and time. And here's our plot with some base R graphics. Um, and here you can see topics three and five uh, tend to lean more conservative, and topic nine tends to lean more liberal. We could do the same thing with time. Here we're going to output the, um, the distribution of one topic over time. And you know, the more pieces of metadata we have, the more we can play with with these types of visualizations. One word of warning is just because you have lots of metadata, it doesn't mean it should all go in the model. Just like you can overfit any kind of model, imagine if you dumped every piece of information about the author you had in the model and when and where and how the author was writing. Eventually, your topic model might start to predict the author herself instead of um, something more generic that could be looked at across documents. So, you know, you should purposefully include metadata that you think might be associated with the distribution of topics or metadata that you want to look at as predictors of the topics themselves. There's a really nice function for analyzing LDA results, either from the topic models package or also from STM, thanks to a handy helper called the 2LDAViz package. But what this neat LDA viz tool does is create an interactive um, HTML widget, which allows you to look at and inspect not only the top words associated with each document, that's the kind of panel on the right here, but also plot the distribution of the topics, both their size and their relationship to each other in a principal component space. So what that means is those circles on the left side, the circles that are closer to each other have similar content, similar probabilities of words appearing in them, and the larger ones are more prevalent in the corpus. So what you can do with this is start to see, well, if there's two topics that are really close to each other, maybe they're the same topic and maybe you should choose a lower value of K. On the other hand, if LDA Viz shows you a giant kind of death star of a topic, right, then you need to increase your value of K because likely that giant death star is actually a lot of little uh, smaller topics. Sorry for the geek reference. Okay, one big problem with topic modeling is that it really does best when it has at least, you know, a couple hundred words in a document. And let's say you want to model tweets. Um, my experience is many of the existing models, LDA, STM, just don't do very well with tweets. So in the polarization lab, we've been lurking on a new solution to this. Um, it's called STLDAC, and it's a really neat technique. The core difference is that rather than assuming a mixture model, where each, in this case, tweet could belong to multiple topics, we rather assume that each tweet can only be assigned to one topic. We think that's reasonable because most tweets aren't very long in the first place and can't really contain more than one topic. So then each user has a distribution over topics and all words in the tweet are a draw from the same distribution over words. Um, so basically it's very similar to a, uh, a topic model except with one added feature, which is that we also cluster users along the way. So it's neat, you get both a topic distribution and a clustering of users, which we often want anyways, if for example, we were gonna try to group Republicans and, and, and Democrats who are all talking about something. Um, and um, we get a really high quality classification that beats, according to our analysis, just about every other model on short text out there. So the repo is linked here. We're gonna add a link to the paper too. 
Go ahead and check that out if you're working with Twitter data. So the limitations of topic models by now are hopefully pretty clear. They're pretty powerful tools for amplified reading, for reading more than you possibly ever could on your own. The danger is, if you really don't have any idea what's in that corpus, um, you may read tea leaves, right? You may start finding patterns that aren't actually patterns themselves. You may also, you know, find false negatives, right? You may have been looking for something and, um, you know, just because a topic model didn't find similar co-occurrence of words, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist in the text. And again, maybe you would have been better served by a simple dictionary analysis. Lastly, topic models assume that word order doesn't matter. It's a so-called bag of words assumption. That means that we dump everything into a document term matrix, and then we just kind of um, assume that a word that begins in the beginning of a document and at the end of the document are equally kind of important in terms of their co-presence near each other. Um, and often that's a reasonable assumption, but sometimes it's not. And that assumption is kind of one thing that we'll revisit when we get into text networks, or if you get to check out my other material on word embeddings, you'll see in that case, we use word sequences to try to solve that problem as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.